I'm here with the Wordy Women, Fiona Higgins, Maggie Joel, and Kylie Ladd. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having us. Now this is this is somewhat overwhelming. I mean, I'd like to talk to you all for hours by yourselves, but all together is just it's somewhat exciting. <laughs> because there's a lot of stuff we can talk about. Um, you've all got new novels out. Um, Fiona's book is about to be released. Uh, Maggie's and, and Kylie's are out there now. In this technological world, with all these things going on, Twitters and the blogging and so many ways of expressing yourself, uh, there's all that bizarre modern art. Why in this world are we still writing novels? Fiona? That's a great question. Um, probably because I don't have time to do anything else. <laughs> all I can do is bang out words on a computer and I, um, I like the, the, the slowness of the publication process. I like the fact that I'm constrained by publication and not banging out 200 words um, instantly onto a blog, which I might later regret. At least with publication, you've got editors and you've got, you know, at least a year. So it's considered thought. Mm -hmm. Potentially. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're writing because people are still reading, thank goodness. Um, and despite all the different technologies that you've just alluded to, people still go back to books and they still get something from book that they can't get from their computer, their television, their, 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 their movie, whatever, which is fantastic. Um, as for why we write, um, I think as Fiona says, there's something about being able to create something yourself. To a large extent, being a writer, you create the entire product on your own. You don't need someone else. You're not working part of a team. I find that <laughs> preferable. You're not part of a huge production unit. Of course, you've got the publishing company, but the fact that you sit there from beginning to end, create the entire book on your own, there's something very satisfying about that. Interesting you say the, um, that process of, of you and controlling the whole lot. Say someone came to you and said, Half World in Winter is a perfect movie. Let us have it, and we'll go mm. mess with your ideas and share it out amongst all these mm. different writers. How comfortable would, would you be with, with that idea? Would no, I sell from... out? In a second. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Because, let's face it, you, your book gets made into a television adaptation, a movie, it's going to sell as a book, regardless of whether the, you know, what involvement you have in the movie or the television adaptation, your book's going to sell. Who, who wouldn't say yes to that? Yes, I would, like a, like a shop. <laughs> and Kylie, why, why are we still writing novels? Look, I just think story is, is a human need. I, I really believe it's up there after food and shelter and, and water, all the rest of it. But I just believe we all love stories. You know, those cavemen, when they'd finished killing their mammoths and, and eating and getting warm around the fire, then they sat down and they told each other stories. They talked about the hunt that day. And we all love a narrative, I think. Um, and, and as uh, Fiona said, the bigger picture too. I, I love writing. I love writing novels because of the bigger picture, but the chance to really get lost in something, in a story again. And, and who hasn't had, sat down and had someone tell them a great story at a dinner party or something and you're going, yeah, go on, go on. That's what writing so is like for me. When we look around the fireplace and, and the cavemen talking about their mammoth, that had a lot to do with passing on the information and, and learning. Do we still True. learn from these, these novels? This medium is still a, a teacher? Definitely. I think uh, so. It's, it's how we make sense of the world we live in. I would say less about learning, but more about making sense of it. And that's what any art is about. Mm. It's take, distilling your particular experience of the world into something so you can make sense of it and so you can pass on that message to someone else. And selfishly, it can be a form of therapy. So <laughs> <laughs> I write about themes that yeah. preoccupy me. Mm -hmm. um, so. Get it out and see and see how it works. To, yeah, to not it's certainly not solve any problems that I raise, but uh, walk with the characters as as they navigate the issues and problems that I'm interested in. Well, you seem to have hit um, hit, hit the current <laughs> pulse uh, with uh, the mother's group. There, there seems to have been something in the mother's group which really spoke to uh, a whole range of readers within Australia because they just pick pick this book up. Mm. And it, it, it started to be to read by thousands and thousands of people. Yes. Um, is that something that's something that you're conscious of when you're writing? You want to be up to date with what's going on and how people are feeling, or is it just you expressing? I, I'm so not up to date. <laughs> 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 no, it's um, it was it was not. It was in fact not even a conscious um, process. I didn't sort of plan the narrative at all. Literally, the six women in the mother's group started speaking to me late at night when I was breastfeeding my sleepless second child. So, um, I, you know, it, it was just an, an incredible creative process. Um, well, you, with, with the wife on the run, you've, um, you've really hit 
this this moment because everyone I speak to, everyone who's been carrying a smartphone around, everyone who's connected, overly connected at the moment, um, feels the, the fear, uh, the loss of identity, the, the, the loss of privacy, those sort of things, but also the great desire for silence. Yes. Which is what the book does. It just they, it's a disconnection, and they, they go out into the into the world and try to discover themselves without this um, intermediary of the internet. Mm. Uh, is, was that just something that you felt bubble up within you? Yes. Had to get out. Yes. Yes. Again, I wasn't thinking about <laughs> very selfish. I wasn't thinking about markets, other people. Um, yes. I mean, I'm I'm a mother of three young kids, and I was projecting forward to about five years from now when they will start being teenagers and I'm already already overwhelmed by the information flow into my life and then thinking oh, then these little guys are going to be out doing all that too and as a parent um, how do I um, how do I navigate that um, you know teenagers and technology can be an explosive mix, as, as, as Kylie writes about so well in Mothers and Daughters. Um, yeah, well, the, the, the relationship for mother and daughter in, in this modern world is terrifying. The amount of information, you sort of want to give out the information bit by bit to, to, to your kids. You don't want them all getting it in one big download. Which, of course, right. you can't. You can't. That's you can't. right. It's you beyond control. your control. Mm. Yep. The minute they go to kinder, it's beyond your control. They're hearing other things. Mm. Um, in Mothers and Daughters, um, You've chosen that relationship. Well, literature in the past has been a lot about mothers and sons. There's been a ton of mothers and sons, um, and that, that's a relationship I always think of as an opposite relationship. There's a kind of, there's a kind of um, oppressiveness on, on, the, on the male side because of overprotectiveness. Um, there's an interest on the women's side because this is a this is an insight into maledom which they've got an access, a key to. Uh, where they get um, direct communication with someone under their control, <laughs> sort of a discovery channel of, 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 of maildom. But um, with with mothers and daughters, there, there is a there is a, a, a kind of there can be a suffocating um, part to this relationship, a, a claustrophobic one, where you know too much about each other, uh, mm. where there were those kinds of um, those kinds of issues which um, separate mothers and mothers and sons bring together, bind maybe a little bit too closely. And you've you've taken five. Um, uh, not, that was four, 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 four. four <laughs> couples, um, uh, mothers and daughters, up into into Broome, into the middle of nowhere. Again, unplugged. Yes, it's a current yes. theme at the moment. <laughs> yes. um, and and dump them there and see see what would happen. Mm -hmm. um, is it because of your relationship with your mother, your relationship with your daughter, this bubbled up? Oh, um, no, not not specifically my relationships with my mother or my daughter. Um, I think it's more watching my friends parent their daughters that's bubbled it all up. I, my own daughter is 12, I want to point that out at every possibility, every possible opportunity on the tour. She's not a teenager, she's not one of the nasty girls <laughs> in this book. I had to get this book out before she was a teenager. Um, but I've certainly watched lots of girlfriends who've got older teenage daughters going through this. And um, the mother-daughter uh, relationship, it's about ageing as well. It's about, um, I mean that's not the main theme, but as the daughters come into teenagehood and they're blossoming, it is about, um, and as the mother of a daughter who's definitely blossoming and has got legs up to here and hair down to there, it's just beautiful, um, I would say that. It, it is about realising that's not you anymore and as, as she's getting more beautiful, you're fading um, and it's she's coming into her own, you know, that's not perhaps happening for you. Um, it all sounds a very negative, but I do also think that that is part of the mother-daughter relationship. That's part of the tension of the mother-daughter relationship as well. And watching all my friends fight with their beautiful, gorgeous 17 and 18 and 14-year-old daughters, that was definitely part of it and something I was very interested in. It's interesting that you've, 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 you've made that point. No, no, this isn't... This is my daughter. <laughs> this is those other people's That's daughter. That's right, exactly. No daughter, but mine. And, and family is central to, to your book. Mm. Um, the opening chapter, which is extraordinary, we're in a just, just an extraordinary <laughs> opening chapter, um, it sends you on this, this, this track one way, <laughs> and you're expecting, oh, this is not, what's this going to be? What's this novel all about? And it, it takes off in this direction, and it is um, this breathtaking opening chapter. And then it, it pulls right back into this family, this sort of closed up family where, where something has happened, something devastating has happened and has altered everybody in, 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 in that family and all their relationships with, within it. Your other books don't concentrate that much on family. This is, this is, a, this is a far more obvious book about um, 
those kinds of relationships and the effect um, of, of great change within, within the family. Uh, is it, how did this book come together? Was it interest in, in um, the mercantile world of the, of the 19th century? Is it interest in family? Is it interest in these kinds of hor horrific tragedies that happened? That's the, the final point that you made is, is exactly right. There were two incidents that I saw on a SBS program, Who Do You Think You Are? And one was um, a small child being burned alive in a horrible domestic accident. And the other one was uh, a train driver being killed in a train accident. Both incidents happened in late Victorian England. And they both struck me that there were incidents that didn't happen so much nowadays and that they seemed to happen a lot at that time. And so that was the starting point. They were both seen quite horrific accidents and I was interested in how the family in a late Victorian household dealt with death. Do they deal with it the same way that we do? Um, do they, how do they cope with death on their day, in a daily basis in the way that they clearly have to face it, which we simply don't have to worry about nowadays? So that was my starting point. The family in the book are an upper middle class family, which means that they are externally focused in that the father runs the railway company. So he's got all the, um, the, the problems, if you like, of what happens when there's a train accident. He suddenly finds himself responsible for people's lives. Within that, you've got the, the mother and the children who are very much internally focused at a domestic setting. They've got to cope with the death within their own family. Um, and their lives are completely constrained by the time period that they're in, uh, particularly the women. Um, their lives are completely prescribed by etiquette books and social mores, the sorts of things that we would find absolutely appalling and, and claustrophobic now. And they have to deal with it. And they struggle against it. At the same time, they draw comfort, I think, from the fact that they have to follow this prescribed set of rules and that's what I found really interesting writing the book looking at that and, and I suppose in any historical fiction you're reading it retrospectively you're reading it from a 21st century viewpoint and we know where what's going to happen to the empire we know what's going to happen you know as this century ends but we're still sort of voyeurs if you like seeing into this family fascinating um, one of the questions that I, I wanted to, to cover here is um, the idea of women's fiction um, I can't stand it. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. That there's no such thing as women's fiction. There's no such thing as the average plumber. You know, these, these are just words that someone's made to make it be convenient for them. How much does it rile you that you're thrown into this, this genre of called women's fiction uh, in, in this day when most women are, um, most um, readers, uh, majority readers um, of fiction are women? Um, so many women are in publishing in the, in the editorial and publishing side of things. So many women are in the, the media. So a lot of the control over how things are uh, expressed is, are in the hands of women, yet this is still around. This idea of contemporary women's fiction or women's fiction mm -hmm. is, is still there. Fiona, you have... Look, you know, I'm still, I'm, I'm still in that phase of being very grateful that um, somebody will publish me. <laughs> so if they want to categorise me yeah. as a, you know, a women's fiction author, that's fine. Um, you know, on the other hand, Kylie and I were talking about um, how how women's fiction is perceived and how uh, writing by women um, might be received differently by audiences versus the same writing by men. And we were talking specifically about the use of um, colourful language <laughs> um, and how that may be less acceptable to audiences coming from a female writer um, versus from a male writer. It seems that way from, from, from feedback. Um, so I think there are you know, elements that define, um, that we are circumscribed by as women's fiction authors, but the category doesn't terribly worry me as long as somebody is publishing me. <laughs> well, I think, I think if, you, if you were worried about it, with the success of the Mother's Group, you can stomp around and demand things, okay? Just enjoy, enjoy, enjoy the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Start <stopping. laughs> yeah. um, Well, I, I think I agree with what Fiona says. I mean, it, marketing people have to market the books and yes, it's naive yes. to think that they're not going to think about stereotypes and feed into that so I think in a way it's inevitable. Um, having said that, a fr uh, the father of a friend of mine said to me the other day, he'd read my first two books and he said I really liked them but there weren't very many male characters and I thought, I, I, I felt quite annoyed by that, I thought well the world is still mostly ren run by men and here's a place where I've got mostly female characters and you know, give me that, don't you know, fight against it. If you don't 
like the fact that there's all these female characters, okay, but don't make it sound like a criticism. To me, it's a positive thing. So I think that's the first time I became aware that possibly a male reader may read it in a different way. But, you know, you can't generalise, I suppose. Some other male reader may read it and not be bothered by that. So, And I suppose, to be fair, I generally read books written by other women that tend to be about women, but it doesn't mean I'm not, you know, happy to sit down and read. Well, my favourite book is by Graham Greene, so he's a man, so... <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the term women's fiction, um, I'll admit, because I think it's reductionist, as, as you're saying. Um, I think you say women's fiction and it immediately conjures up to a lot of people uh, something with a pastel pink cover and a high heel or, you know, a handbag or something like that on yes. it. Yes. That's right. And, and um, if, if I hear my work described as women's fiction, um, I think, I hope that doesn't mean everybody thinks it's about shopping. Um, yeah. may, maybe I'm wrong to think that. Maybe I'm being silly. But that said, I don't like the term commercial fiction all that much either, which is the other term that mm. uh, genre that my book gets put under. Um, I'd just like to say I write books and I write stories, mm. but it is the nature of the market to make things easier for people, to put them into little boxes so you know this, you can digest things more easily this way. So I understand it has to happen, but um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd rather commercial fiction than women's fiction. I think that is too reductionist. Mine often gets the heading historical fiction, we'll and that's something I but feel that's a good quite... Heading, isn't well, it? I feel uneasy about it because I think there's a sense that it's going to be historical romance. Mm. And right. I think of Catherine Cooks and Georgette mm. Hayes, yes. and that's my own prejudice, I suppose. So I feel uneasy about it. Um, well, that's what I feel about women's fiction. Yeah. I feel that if I say I write women's fiction, people say, oh, Milson Boone, mm. and I go, no. Yeah. I mean, as if that's all that women are... are my concern writing. about women's fiction is that potentially reduces your number of male yeah. readers. Yes. Now, so, yes. for the Mother's Group, for example, yeah. there are plenty of women who have read it and then passed it to their husband on the other side of the bed and said, hey, have a, have a read of this. And I know this from reader feedback. Yeah. What a shame that the cover and yeah. its category would preclude a bloke, potentially, from walking into a bookstore and picking it up. So. Oh, I want, that's great. Yeah. Please, right. The next question is, is, what are you reading now? Carly, what are you reading now? Oh, 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 oh. oh okay. <laughs> I'm reading something that's really good. I'm reading Maggie's book. That's <laughs> something really good at the moment. It's not uh, no, no, there are I've got about a hundred pages to go, Maggie. I just right. couldn't quite finish it before no we got away. No, yeah. I really, I really am thoroughly enjoying it. And I have um, another Alan and Unwin, fortuitously, an author's book next to go. Um, Rebecca James's new book, Keep Above All Me Is Dead, YA book. I like YA. I've got two YAs living with me, so I'm looking forward to reading that. Um, I've just been loaned The Railwayman's Wife by oh, Ashley Hay, which wonderful. is an Alan and Unwin book. Mm. Um, right. And it was loaned to me by a colleague who um, just helped me launch my book and sort of said, the historical fiction, have a, you'll, you'll like it. So, And I'm about 50 pages in and I'm enjoying it very much. Are you, are you super critical of, of writers writing in your area? Or? Railways? Um, <laughs> the railway part of it, I'm thinking, oh, mm. she hasn't, hasn't given me very many specifications about this train yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I know. Um, but it is very different. I mean, this is set in post-war um, southern New South Wales. It's very much about the Australian experience post-war. So it's much more focused on that, I think, than, than trains. Okay. <laughs> I'm reading uh, The 100-Year-Old Man Who Climbed Out of a Window and Disappeared. I think I should have read it about two and a half years ago. But uh, I've got this enormous uh, pile. Um, and uh, also I, I'm wanting to read uh, Annabelle Crabbe's Life Drills. Yes. That's also on my pile. Well, um, thank you very much for coming in. It's been a delight chatting. We could chat all afternoon. There's so many subjects we can wander in. Each book has a whole range of, of topics which we could wander through and, and uh, I feel I haven't done um, justice to any of them in this conversation. We're covering a, a few of the, the subjects that are, that are prevalent right now. I think um, uh, it's, it's sort of showing, showing that you're aware of what's going on. Your, um, your fiction is growing with each, each book and the lessons that are, that are coming through. Um, so I want to um, end with recommending to that camera <laughs> <laughs> Maggie Joel's Half the World in Winter, <laughs> Fiona Higgins' Wife on the Run, and Kylie Ladd's Mothers and Daughters.